all this inflation has its roots in the 2008 financial crisis and the government bailouts, QE1, QE2, QE3, all of that was inflation. The Fed let loose all of these inflation chickens back then. They're finally starting to come home to roost and there's a lot more of them out there because initially investors were worried that all this quantitative easing would cause a lot of inflation and they were correct. In fact, quantitative easing is inflation. It's just inflation by another name and inflation ultimately causes prices to rise. But temporarily, what happened was a lot of that inflation went into financial assets, went into stocks, bonds, real estate, stuff like that. Now it's migrated into consumer goods and it is there to stay. The only problem is that there was a long lag between all the inflation that was created and the impact on consumer prices. Well, now we've arrived at that impact. There's so much inflation in the pipeline that nothing the Fed is doing now is going to uh, turn off that spigot. In fact, what they are doing now is completely inadequate for the task at hand, because the only way to get rid of 8% inflation is to have interest rates that are above 8%. You need positive real interest rates so that you change consumer behavior. We need less spending and more savings. Well, no one is going to save more if you still have negative interest rates. If interest rates in a bank account are 1% and if you can only get 2 or 3% on longer term treasuries, why would you do that when inflation is destroying the value of your purchasing power? by 8% a year. No, you're going to spend everything you've got. And if we encourage more spending, well, that's uh, more inflation. And of course, the root cause of all the money printing is the massive federal budget deficits, which are continuing to be $2 trillion plus per year. And ultimately, that spending is not only fueling demand, but it is causing the Federal Reserve and will cause the Federal Reserve to have to go back to quantitative easing, despite the fact that it's talking about shrinking its balance sheet, it's going to be expanding that balance sheet, and that is more inflation. So there is no way the Fed can actually succeed in fighting inflation unless it allows interest rates to rise above the rate of inflation and forces the U.S. government to slash government spending. None of those things is going to happen. And so the inflation problem is going to get worse. And one of the other qualifications that the Federal Reserve has always put on its inflation battle is its willingness to be so tough on inflation, even though it wasn't tough, but it was just talking tough, but its actions uh, speak louder than its words. But the reason that the Fed was talking tough about fighting inflation was because the Fed also claimed we had this booming economy. We had a super strong economy, the strongest economy ever. We had this uh, red hot labor market. And because we had such a strong economy with such a strong labor market that we could easily withstand the rate increases that were necessary to fight inflation. Oh, and by the way, the reason the Fed can't raise interest rates high enough to fight inflation is because it would create not only a depression, but a financial crisis, because there's no way that all the debtors could pay that debt. And so everything would implode which is why the Fed is not fighting inflation, because it can't, but it can't admit that. So it's pretending that it will. And part of the pretense was the strong economy that was enabling this fight without the type of collateral damage that there would normally be when the Fed was fighting inflation, even though this time there should be much more collateral damage because we have more inflation than ever and we have an economy more vulnerable than ever to rising interest rates. The economy has been in a recession for all of 2022. In fact, back in 2021, when I was a lone voice predicting that inflation wasn't transitory and would get stronger, I was also predicting that the economy would get weaker at the same time. I forecast that the US economy would be in recession in the first half of 2022, and I got that right. But I said, even though the economy would be weaker than anybody thought, inflation would be stronger than anybody thought. So I got both right. My prediction was stagflation, but that the stagnation would actually be recession, not just slow growth. Well, now that the Fed has now been confronted with the data, and I always assumed that once the GDP numbers came out for the second quarter, that they would have to admit that 
the, we were in recession. In fact, they shrugged off the negative GDP in the first quarter and still pretended that we had a booming economy. But when we followed that up with the second quarter of negative GDP growth, I initially thought, well, okay, they're just gonna have to admit there's a, re a recession, but no, they haven't admitted it. They're still denying that there's a recession. And how are they doing that? Well, they're redefining what a recession means. Housing's in recession, autos are in recession, retail, advertising, you know, all sorts of unrelated parts of the economy are contracting, uh, yet somehow that doesn't constitute a broad-based decline. So despite this evidence, the government continues to pretend that the economy is not in recession. And part of that is so the Fed can continue to talk tough about raising interest rates because it's ignoring the damage that those rate hikes have already done and will continue to do. Because as the Fed continues to raise interest rates, GDP growth in Q3 and probably in Q4 will also be negative. Now, I'm not saying the Fed is wrong to raise interest rates. The Fed needs to raise interest rates. In fact, it's the market that needs to raise interest rates. The Fed needs to get out of the way. That's what Paul Volcker did. He didn't put interest rates at 20%. He got out of the way. And the markets put interest rates at 20%, even though inflation was no higher than 13.5%. And of course, if we still measured inflation today using the same CPI that we used to measure it in 1981, we would be much higher than 13.5%. And the markets would obviously put interest rates maybe even higher than 20% if they were allowed to function. But they're not being allowed to function for the obvious reason that everything would collapse. Back in 1980, we could afford to pay 20% on our debt. We only had about 1 trillion in the national debt, not 31 trillion like we have now. But more importantly, most of that debt was locked in with 10 to 30 year treasuries. So higher interest rates only affected the immediate borrowing needs of the US government. Now, with about a third of the debt maturing every year, we have such a short maturity and we have such enormous current deficits that any big spike up in interest rates immediately bankrupts the U.S. government. There is no feasible way of making those payments. They can't raise taxes high enough to do it. And of course, if interest rates went that high, we would be in a massive recession. And so tax revenues would collapse while government spending exploded. So there is no viable way uh, to allow interest rates to rise to a market clearing level, but that is still the right thing to do. All of this stuff would be political dynamite. I mean, it would probably be suicide for whatever the party is in power that was forced to acknowledge all this, which is why it is not going to happen. The Fed does not have the political will to force all this to happen. So everything it's saying about its commitment to fight inflation is a bluff. The Fed will give up the inflation fight as soon as it's too politically dangerous to continue it. As soon as the collateral damage is great enough that the Fed has to pivot and then focus on the economy, on employment, on financial markets, because that is what the Fed has always done and that is what the Fed is going to do.